Where's Mitzi? We were just saying, Mitzi, if we could use it as a valid excuse that a foreign military power hacked into our town hall. I think we have everything working now. All right, Catherine. You're good. Thank you. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the Scarborough Guildwood 424 Virtual Town Hall. Today, we're joined by all three levels of government in Scarborough Guildwood. From the City of Toronto, we have Councillor Paul Ainsley. From the province, we have MPP Mitzi Hunter. And from the federal government, we have the Honorable John McKay. Councillor Ainsley was first elected to Toronto City Council in 2006. He's now in his third term and he has diligently worked for his residents. As chair of the Government Management and Municipal Licensing Committee, Paul has been tasked to ensure that transparency in our government is shared by all. Born and raised in Scarborough, where Paul currently lives uh, with his three wife and children. Mitzi was elected as member of provincial parliament in 2013 and she's in her third term as the MPP for Scarborough Guildwood. She is currently the critic for finance and treasury and is the former minister of education. She also recently served as the minister of advanced education and skills development. Finally, the honorable John McKay was first elected as member of parliament in 1997. He was reelected in October of 2019 to serve his eighth term in the house of commons. He currently represents the constituency of Scarborough Guildwood and is chair of the standing committee on public safety and national security. So we have invited constituents to submit questions ahead of time by phone and by email, and we've had an overwhelming response. So we'll start off with some of these questions, but please feel free to ask questions in the comments. And I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties that have uh, delayed our response. It's okay with everyone, we can uh, go a few minutes late. So our first question comes from Andre and is for all levels of government. Andre is interested in detailed planning for reopening the economy and society. He wants to know when we can expect more details for both the short and the long term. What are our plans for a second wave? And can we start planning now with details? I'll open it up for answers. I can start. Um, I think the first thing that we have to do in terms of opening up the economy is deal with the health crisis that is before us in terms of COVID-19. We really have to make sure, doubly sure that Ontario's economy um, doesn't falter if we open prematurely. And, uh, and so this week, uh, the government of Ontario issued three stages that need to be um, considered when we are looking at, uh, at opening up the economy. And I think the, the most important uh, part of, of, of the, that phase is really the health risk that we're confident that uh, as we track the spread of the virus that it's declining. And uh, we wanna see that anywhere from two to four weeks consistently decreasing in terms of the number of cases of COVID-19. And, um, and that there is adequate and appropriate ability for the government to identify where cases are occurring, that those cases can be traced to specific individuals and of course contained uh, to those individuals and that it's not spread amongst the community. Uh, also making sure that we have adequate public health capacity, the financial accountability Office of Ontario issued a report this week that measured Ontario's hospital capacity to deal with COVID-19. And we are actually very well prepared with uh, ICU and critical care beds in Ontario, should there be a surge on our healthcare system. So we can have some confidence in that. And then um, making sure that there is the ability to track any incidences that, that would occur. So from Certainly from a, a provincial standpoint, it's about making sure that we can manage the health crisis and that those cases are coming down steadily over a sustained period of time. I think from the federal standpoint, uh, the federal government is largely deferential to the provinces. Each province has its unique challenges and you, you saw actually a divergence in approach between Ontario and Quebec. Uh, Quebec seems to have um, uh, taking a bit more of an aggressive approach in Ontario, not quite so aggressive. Um, I think the the big issue is that um, there is a linkage between health and the economy, um, and and it's contradictory. Uh, the the health uh, requirements are that we uh, isolate, that we uh, uh, separate. 
uh, an economy by definition means that we uh, are actually working together and are interacting with each other. So those are uh, divergent um, demands uh, for um, constituents who are looking for precise um, opening points in the economy. Um, I think they will look in vain because uh, th this is uh, inevitably a, um, a moving target. Um, I'm rather hoping that um, the Ontario government and to a lesser extent the city government will um, eliminate some things that are clearly not um, risk to the population um, and uh, allow those elements of opening uh, that can be opened with minimal risk because this ultimately at the end of the day is a management of risk. Yeah, and, and from the municipal level, I, I echo what John and Mitzi are saying, you know, it's all about, as they say, flattening the curve, making sure that uh, we're doing everything properly, that we get as many people tested as possible, uh, that making sure everybody's practicing the, the social distancing guidelines. I think what's of paramount importance to everybody is that everybody be safe and secure and that we do our very best to ensure that we don't see a second wave coming through. Thanks, Catherine. Great, thank you. Um, so this is another one that's a broad kind of issue, but since it involves um, Dr. Teresa Tam, I'll ask John to weigh in first. Uh, we've seen a rise in racist incidents um, in response to COVID-19 pandemic, particularly against uh, Asian Canadian communities. Um, so what is being done to address these, uh, this rise in racist incidents? Oh, this, this is so discouraging. Um, the last uh, direct face-to-face -face conversation I had with the prime minister was over lunch at a Chinese restaurant in Agent Court. <laughs> and the attempt at that point was um, to demonstrate on the part of the prime minister, the Scarborough caucus and the, the rest of the government that um, the uh, attacks on the uh, Chinese community were absolutely unacceptable and yet they go on and um, this is uh, this is very discouraging this is not to do with uh, anything to do with um, our local Chinese community or even um, our the international Chinese community or even the people of China so um, I honestly, uh, you know, other than repeating uh, the same uh, concerns over and over again, uh, I'm, there are days I despair. I particularly despair of comments on part of one of my colleagues. Um, and I wish uh, he hadn't said what he said, but he did say what he said. I take note that the Conservative Caucus is attempting to deal with um, what um, my uh, one of my colleagues said, um, I have nothing but absolute admiration for Dr. Tan. I think she has um, provided uh, the government of Canada and the people of Canada with the best possible advice that we can uh, hope for. I think she has been brilliant in her management of, um, of the uh, risk. I think she has given us honest, straightforward advice based upon a lifetime of experience and a expertise that is unparalleled. She is, um, she is a national treasure and she has, um, she has uh, and her, her uh, talent as a um, uh, epidemiologist is recognized uh, around the world, hence her position on the WHO. So um, I guess we always have in these kinds of um, national issues um, bumps. I regret that this bump uh, has come up. Um, and I say to all the citizens in Scarborough Guildwood and all the citizens in, in Canada, Dr. Tam is a national treasure. There is no basis, absolutely no basis for uh, any commentary to the contrary. Yeah. I just want to add one tiny um, thing on this because uh, I think John has nailed it. Um, there's no place for um, any form of racism in in Ontario and Canada. 
and we're, we're a country that is built on multiculturalism and inclusion and you know whenever we see acts of racism we should call it out and and just really not tolerate it look at the faces of the heroes during this pandemic look at the people who are out there on the front lines in long-term care providing personal support work or um, maintaining our nursing system um, our food supply chain you know, look at those faces because those faces represent a very broad diversity in Canada and they're the heroes of this pandemic. So not only is there no place for uh, any form of racism, um, but also it is a time that we should come together and we should all embrace and, and, and appreciate each other and, and the humanity that we all share during this crisis. Yeah, it's, it's the one thing I, that I always appreciate as a city councillor in Toronto, when I'm talking with people and I say, you know, why, why, why did you come to Toronto? What brought you here? And the first thing that people always say to me is, you know, they came here, they can practice their religion, um, they can live in their community without fear of any type of persecution. And, and I think that's really what makes us Canada. And, you know, unfortunately, we have isolated cases of racism and people get uptight or stressed during a pandemic, but we really, you know, need to call those instances out and, uh, and do our best to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you. So this question is for Mitzi. Um, when he's due on May 1st for countless Ontarians, what is being done for tenants that are paying rent? We've seen some relief for people collecting rent and still being able to defer some mortgage payments while tenants continue to pay some of the highest prices. So this is something that I know is on so many people's minds right now. On Friday um, is another month that's rolling around uh, when so hundreds and thousands of Ontarians' lives have been completely disrupted, not able to go to work, uh, mandated to not be able to go to work and therefore that paycheck is not coming in as it normally uh, does. Uh, obviously, um, John can speak to the measures that the federal government has stepped in to provide in terms of uh, emergency uh, payments to people and I know that that's uh, being well, well used by many Ontarians. But the fact of the matter is um, there really hasn't been any residential um, supports in Ontario that we've seen in other provinces such as BC, uh, where there was a $500 um, support uh, for, for people who needed to um, offset their rents. So that still is an area that uh, residential um, rent relief is, is an area that is still needed in Ontario. Um, the government has taken steps to um, prevent evictions. So there is there is no evictions uh, being uh, done at this time. Uh, the landlord and tenant board will not issue evictions at this time. Uh, but at the same time, people feel the pressure because, you know, even if they haven't paid rent, the amount owing is still piling up and, and will one day become due um, and put people at risk of, uh, of not being able to continue to be housed. And we can't have that in our province. So I issued a, a statement this week calling on the provincial government to um, respond now with rent relief and uh, perhaps follow the BC model of the $500 amount um, and certainly to put a moratorium on rent increases at least until the end of the year. Thank you, Mitzi. We have a question in the comments from Jeff. I believe this one is for Paul and maybe Mitzi. While we see good statistic updates for Toronto's COVID-19 cases, the Public Health Unit for Toronto covers many wards. Do you have any indication on how Ward 24 is doing in terms of higher or lower than average? Yeah, so the the um, so there's guidelines around releasing health information. Um, so th our health department doesn't release any information on a on a ward by ward basis. They have uh, the citywide information. They've actually got an interactive 
uh, website on Toronto.ca that you can go to, um, which is releasing real time information on the COVID cases across the city, not just um, on a, a numbered basis. They also do it um, by gender, um, different age categories, um, but they don't release any personal information on what's happening on a ward by ward basis. Thank you, Paul. Uh, another one for you. What will happen to July and August property tax scheduled payments? Uh, so right now with property taxes, we've uh, all of the spring tap property taxes have been deferred. Uh, so if yours was due on, say, uh, April 1st, they've been deferred for 60 days. Uh, so they've done that for uh, March, April and May. And um, once we get further in along, um, hopefully we'll start to see the curve flatten out um, and we'll look at uh, restarting the economy. In, in June is I think what our best guess is now. And then we'll be looking at what we're gonna do with uh, the, the summer property tax payments. Um, if you don't wanna defer your property taxes and do wanna to continue to pay them, we there is a mechanism to continue to pay them uh, if you want. And you can also get in contact uh, with your bank as well if you're making property tax payments through your bank. Well, maybe I could jump in on this because I think the next next big thing in this crisis is the uh, difficulties with respect to municipalities. Um, maybe you could offer some commentary on the, if you will, the burn rate of the government of Toronto, the city of Toronto, and the uh, anticipation of when it might um, actually uh, run out of money and um, uh, because you have, if you will, statutory limitations on the uh, the ability to raise money, unlike uh, the provincial and the federal government. So maybe it would be useful to, to indicate to uh, the constituents what this actually means in real terms, because I don't think you want to be the councillor that's going to be uh, talking about cuts back, cutbacks to services and um, layoffs and et cetera, et cetera. So maybe it's an opportunity to say what, what the implications of, of this um, decline in revenues might be. So we so thanks, John. We do have what's called uh, it's referred to as a burn rate, um, and that talks about. So we look at what it's costing to run the city. Um, so basically, it's the money that we're spending versus the the money that uh, we would would see coming in as revenue. For example, um, permits in our parks. Um, the big one is the Toronto Transit Commission. Um, we're, we see a loss of about $20 million a week just from uh, the Toronto Transit Commission. And we depend on all of that money uh, to run the city. So collectively, we refer to the burn rate, which is by, uh, by, puts us behind the eight ball, $65 million a week. And one of the things that I always joke about in the Canadian Constitution, you can never see the word city. And so, you know, we depend on the provincial and federal government to support us financially in a number of different areas. Um, and we're also not allowed to carry a, uh, a deficit or a debt. So all that being said, um, we're trying to figure out how to manage the city. Unfortunately, we just had to lay off uh, 1,200 of our uh, TTC employees. Um, because, as I mentioned earlier, we have a huge uh, revenue to cost ratio gap there. And unfortunately, we had to temporarily lay off employees to cover that gap. Great, thank you. Uh, so a question for Mitzi. Um, we all know that pharmacists have put a 30 day limit on medication dispensing. Um, but copays are being paid three times instead of once for three months supply. What is being done to address the increasing copay? Thank you so much. Uh, this is a question that uh, we've been getting from residents uh, in Scarborough Guildwood who traditionally had been able to purchase their or obtain their prescription medication um, in three months supply. And uh, in response to the pandemic, uh, the province uh, limited the uh, amount to one month supply just to make sure that we have 
adequate amounts of prescription medication for everyone in the province who needed access to that medication. But one of the consequences of doing that is that each time someone goes to the pharmacist to fill a prescription, there is um, a, a copay dis, uh, as part of the dispensing fee that goes to the pharmacist. So that, you know, it, it might be, it, the fee varies depending on the pharmacist, um, you know, $3.50. It might not sound like a lot, but if you're a senior who is on fixed income um, or an individual who, you know, has a very, very tight budget, that amount adds up. So we've been getting a lot of requests in, in my constituency office to, um, to you know, ask the provincial government to um, stop that fee or work with the pharmacists uh, community um, to, to stop it. And, and we've actually asked this question directly of the health minister and, uh, and the response we've gotten back is, is you know, is not satisfactory in my opinion. Um, you know, they're asking individuals basically to negotiate with uh, with their pharmacists and to ask them to you know to not t charge this fee. Some of our residents have, have actually tried to do that, and they do notice that some of the smaller independent pharmacies have you know waived the fee, which is gracious of them. But overall, it it has been a a, a big challenge. Uh, the minister has uh, has said that uh, she is aware of the issue and uh, and that they are going to be addressing it but we're still waiting and you know once again another month is coming when many people are going to have to refill those prescriptions and unfortunately that uh, dispensing fee is still there so there is much more that we can do it is a small amount but you know that those dollars do add up and people need to keep that money in their pocket, especially at this time when they're dealing with a pandemic and potentially have lost uh, most of their income. Thank you. So I'm getting feedback that it's a bit hard to hear me. So if I could ask you all to repeat the question I'm asking just so that everyone not in the audience knows what we're talking about, that would be great. Uh, so our next question is for Paul and John. Uh, I know that you just mentioned that unfortunately 1,200 PPC employees had to be laid off. Uh, this question comes from the comments from Austin. Would it be possible for the federal government to uh, invest some additional funds in the PPC um, because those workers, if laid off, would be um, getting federal funding through the CERB anyway? Is that something that you're looking into? Is that a possibility? Not sure that I understand the question. I additional funds in terms of infrastructure funds, or in terms of support for employees, or uh, things of that nature. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I quite, Paul. Maybe you understand the question better than I do, but I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Yeah, I I think what they're saying, John, is instead of laying off 1,200 employees, is there some uh, support through the CERB? that they can receive personally um, to, to subsidize their wages so they're not laid off. Or well, if they are laid well, off, they can be the supported. City, wouldn't the city be entitled to the same um, uh, application for the 75% subsidy that everybody else is? Yep, yep. So that's your subsidy. Um, yep. I, I, so I, uh, I would think that uh, equality of treatment is uh, is the appropriate uh, response, and that uh, there is already a uh, subsidy that's available through the federal government. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Paul from email. What food and financial supports are available to seniors by the city? And if you could repeat that, that would be great. Yeah, so what, what uh, financial support for food do we have for seniors? Um, unfortunately, as a, at the municipal level, we, we don't really have any um, programs or financial supports for seniors for, for food at this time. I just uh, uh, point out that we put up $100 million last week for uh, food insecurity or food security as the case may be. Um, and um, uh, five, five organizations, including um, Salvation Army and the Breakfast uh, Clubs, et cetera, et cetera, received uh, something in the order of about $20 million each 
uh, in order to be able to uh, purchase uh, food and uh, then they will in turn distribute it out through the uh, networks of those various clubs. I, um, I think that's uh, probably one of the most significant initiatives that the, the federal government has taken in order to be able to make sure that everybody is eating uh, during this uh, crisis. Yeah, I, I think more from the, the municipal level, we're trying to help everybody the best of our ability by deferring our property taxes. Uh, we've deferred utility bills for, for water and electricity. We're trying to do what we can within our means and jurisdiction to, to help people. We're running the, as John said, there's uh, food banks uh, um, right in our own ward. There's five and two kitchens. It's a soup kitchen. Um, trying to do what we can within the powers that we have. Yeah, and people can call, contact 211 to find out uh, where they can go uh, for assistance uh, for food banks uh, in the community. And uh, just to make sure that at this time, you know, no one um, is left hungry and that people have what they need in particular for seniors. Uh, many of the food bank um, responses are, are, are changing their approach to actually get uh, food out to seniors who need it or who need assistance in getting that food. So please, uh, please use that resource that the city has with 211 as well. Yeah, it was $100 million, and I'm just reading from the Government of Canada website here, Food Banks Canada, Salvation Army, Second Harvest, Community Food Centers, and Breakfast Club of Canada, and they in turn will spread the... Um, uh, spread that uh, money among uh, the various uh, partnerships and networks. So it's a pretty significant response on the part of the government of Canada. I expect that if this continues longer than any of us would wish, that that will have to be topped up. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to say, I guess... um, for, for those uh, people who might be listening or who have partnerships, uh, you know, with... Um, uh, community uh, in, in Scarborough Guildwood, the uh, provincial government through Ontario Disability Support Program and through OW is providing a $100 emergency benefit. And, um, and this amount, you just need to contact your caseworker that you would normally contact and they will uh, give you access to this uh, $100 uh, one-time benefit you know, I know that that's uh, going to make a difference for some individuals and, uh, and it is available. And, there, and there's also the Red Cross, uh, the City of Toronto has a partnership with the Red Cross for seniors they can't get out of their homes. Um, they can register through my office for that if they want. Um, and that Red Cross will deliver uh, food hampers to seniors homes that qualify. This next question is for Don from Zad. What is the federal government doing to help with mortgage relief? Are there any plans in the works? And what would you want to tell homeowners that are currently in the position of paying interest on deferred mortgage payments? Um, so the question is about uh, mortgage deferrals. Um, currently, if you go to your bank, uh, um, you can negotiate a mortgage deferral um, and it's deferral. It's not a cancellation. It's not a, not a, a, a free card by any means. Um, and that will postpone the, uh, the mortgage payment. The concern is the doubling up of interest. Um, and I know the caucus has been all over that um, and it continues to be a point of contention because uh, not only are you deferring the, uh, the payment, but you're, uh, the payment, which is a combination of principal and interest, but you don't want interest to be accumulating. Um, so uh, uh, thus far, um, I think um, in the, on the 1st of April, it was $800 million of deferred mortgage payments. Uh, May 1st is right around the corner. I expect that that will be even higher. Um, and, um, and, um, and let's hope that we're not going to be getting to the same kinds of numbers for June 1st. So uh, $800 million worth of deferrals is a significant sum of money. Thank you. This question is for Mitzi from Jane. Is the province tracking overall deaths in Ontario to get a clear picture of the state of the situation? Perhaps folks are avoiding the hospital or are dying from unreported COVID-19 infections. Hi, Jane. Um, so at this time, we 
are getting daily updates uh, from the province, uh, the chief medical officer of health and the deputy on you know, direct um, tracking for COVID-19 deaths and those also in long-term care because unfortunately one of the sad realities of COVID-19 is that it has um, really ravaged uh, our elderly population, particularly those who are in long-term care in our seniors home. Um, one of the earliest outbreaks in seniors home occurred right in our community at uh, Seven Oaks, um, at uh, Nielsen and Ellesmere. And, um, and, and unfortunately in many long-term care homes across the province and the country, in fact, those, those deaths uh, continue to climb. Um, we are seeing a better response uh, from, from the province in recent days in terms of you know, bringing in the military for the most um, in need locations that were short of staff. And we thank the government of Canada um, and in particular MP Bill Blair for, uh, for signing off on that. And uh, also um, hospital and medical um, responses has now become even more available for uh, people who are in long-term care. Just uh, this week, the as I mentioned earlier, the Financial Accountability Officer released a, a report on the hospitals in Ontario and their capacity to manage a surge and to manage um, through this pandemic. And what it revealed was that we actually have a lot of capacity that is not currently being used in our hospitals because um, you know, elective surgeries were, were canceled and, uh, and many other um, routine um, treatments were, were not uh, being done at this time. And that has resulted, the Minister of Health has actually admitted that there are some 35 people who perhaps have fallen victim to not getting their, their regular treatment um, that was scheduled because of the pandemic and, and, and they you know, have uh, fallen, uh, fallen victim to, to COVID even though COVID was not the reason why they passed on. So this is, uh, this is, this is a concern, um, you know, it's something that, um, that we are looking into uh, some of the hospital executives have, have really called on the government, for instance, to have funding available to increase a ramp up of those uh, surgeries, maybe, you know, round the clock on weekends and uh, making sure that there's a plan in place to get to catch up and to make sure everyone gets the health care that they definitely need. I, th I just uh, add in here, this, uh, Mitzi has alluded to the uh, indirect costs of COVID and uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, indirect costs that's emerging is the postponement of surgeries, which is a, a more dramatic aspect, but it's not only a postponement of surgeries, but it's the uh, failure to go to uh, doctors when you should be going to see doctors and, um, and doing uh, the uh, routine health things that you should be doing when, uh, but you don't feel like doing because of your, your declining mental health or, uh, you know, not going out and doing what the things that are good for you, either, uh, you know, exercise or something of that nature. And um, it's very hard to quantify all of these indirect health costs, but um, it does speak to the larger issue of why it's so difficult to be precise about how to open up uh, the, um, the normal functioning of an economy and of society. Um, so um, uh, I think, um, uh, I think uh, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, all three of us are on the same page um, as are all three levels of government on the same page. Um, and yet normally um, uh, there is uh, not a, 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 a very friend or friendly relationship, particu particularly between the federal government and the provincial government. Um, and uh, and uh, yet it's uh, kind of a testimony to our nation that we actually have all pulled together in spite of our political uh, views. 
I, I, I truly uh, agree with that, John. And, and, you know, one of the things that uh, everyone knows is when you need the medical system, you want it to be there for your loved one. And, you know, just today I had a need for the, the hospital system for, for my, my dad, my stepdad actually. And, um, and, and my brother and I uh, worked together to, uh, to take him through the emergency process. It, it was extremely well organized. And, um, and, you know, one of the things that my brother said to me was how caring and how gentle everyone was uh, during that, um, that, that, that need that we had as mm -hmm. a family. And, uh, and so I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our healthcare heroes and those people who, uh, you know, paramedics and, you know, the intake people and, you know, those who clean the facilities and, you know, it, it, we are living in uh, the best province in the best country in the world. And our medical system and our ability to work together has been tested during this pandemic. And I believe that uh, we have a, a system that yes, it, there are improvements that we need to make, but the, it is the people, the dedicated people who um, are so skilled and so talented and, and they put it all, all out there um, for taking care of everybody. And I just wanna say a huge thank you to, to all of the healthcare heroes. Amen, sister. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, this question, I think, is for Paul. It's from the comments. As staged reopening happens, the ridership on transit will increase and the ability for social distancing will be reduced. Transit capacity in the GTA is such that social distancing is impossible on a normal transit ride. How are you going to address this? And uh, I'll ask you to repeat that in condensed form if you can. Um, I think there are still troubles with hearing you to the extent. Yeah, so, so what you're asking, Catherine, is so with the, uh, once we try and get our transit system or we try and get our society back to a normal economic uh, position, what we're gonna do to, for transit and social distancing on transit, and there's so many issues now because of overcrowding. Is that it in a nutshell? Yeah, yeah. So, so what we've what we've done right now is um, we're trying to enforce some type of social distancing on all of our TTC vehicles. Uh, we're only allowing 50 people per vehicle. We're um, having people load by the by the back doors, so there's uh, less interaction. So as we um, try and get the economy rolled out again and and back to work. Um, you know, depending on the situation with COVID-19, we're either going to have to find a way to continue the social distancing policies on vehicles. Um, you know, we're going to have, have to buy more vehicles or, or make sure our, our fleets maintain much better than it is um, to impact those social distancing rules. But, you know, it is a, a huge issue uh, and we're going to have to come to grips with it. I have another question for Mitzi, which we received both by email and in the comments. Uh, why is Ontario's pandemic pay to frontline workers limited in scope when the list of essential workers is so large? And I'll ask you to repeat that if you can. So this is definitely um, a, a concern that we've heard repeatedly, and it's the need for pandemic pay for those frontline workers that I was just talking about, all of those heroes. And, um, and it was something that, you know, certainly uh, I had called for as part of the response to um, the long-term care situation, because you had, you know, personal support workers and other staff who were not very well paid, who were being asked at this time to, um, to show up for work and to do very challenging work. Um, and so we pressed and, and continue to advocate uh, for the provincial government to provide an increase in pay for, for those frontline uh, healthcare workers 
who were not receiving adequate uh, pay for what we were asking them to do, and we want to make sure that they're valued. And and the the government, uh, you know, working together as uh, as John has has already said. Uh, recognize that this this was something that was needed and a four dollar an hour uh, was committed to over 350,000 um, workers who are doing this essential essential job and uh, just uh, last night um, the government also announced that other workers such as uh, paramedics would be covered by this pandemic pay um, and also those workers such as personal support workers who are not just working for a government agency but who are working perhaps for a private um, um, organization or a nonprofit would also uh, qualify for this four dollars an hour uh, so so it is an important step i know um, that there are other uh, types of jobs uh, that that want to also benefit from this uh, four dollars an hour, but I do know that the government initial um, amounts were to go to those who have a direct um, role in dealing with individuals who are affected by the virus and they have to provide that care. Thank you, Missy. Uh, this is a question for all of you to weigh in on. Um, this comes from Claudine. Um, can you clarify the social distancing rules for the general public? People need to strike a balance between being cautious and living their lives. Yeah. Hey, Paul, so, this is your jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> Better repeat the question. Yeah. And, and so trying to clarify the, the rules around social distancing, and, and this is probably the one question that I was inundated with the most as people are trying to understand, and we call it the you know, the, the two six, the two six, you know, you need to be two meters apart from uh, other people or six feet. And I always call it the very Canadian way to measure this is to visualize a hockey stick. If I hold out a hockey stick or a lacrosse stick and I can poke you with it, you're too close to me. So you want to be six feet away or, uh, or farther than that. And then we also have a rule we're, we're following that's been mandated down on us from the province. Public gatherings, you can't have any more than five people in any public gathering. Um, and you, we, tr we would prefer that people from households don't intermingle with each other. Um, and this applies in all of our public spaces, including our parks. Uh, we've had some discussion around park benches, if you're going out for a walk, which we fully encourage. Um, we don't want people gathering on park benches and um, hanging out. If you're up for a walk or, you know, you take your dog for a walk and you want to catch your breath on a park, that's fully allowed. Um, but we're doing all that to monitor social distancing. The one good thing is if you have a, your family, um, any number of people who live in one household, and you decide to go out, the social distancing rules don't apply to you as long as you're only interacting in public amongst yourselves. I just uh, add a little bit of common sense would be, um, would be appreciated. Some people just ignore these rules and it's really quite depressing. Uh, the sooner, uh, I think all three levels of government have been repeating the notion that uh, the more social distance and respect of the COVID protocols that we have, the greater likelihood is that we get ourselves out from this sooner rather than later. So you're actually um, not only um, counterproductive to the health of your neighbor, you're counterproductive to your own health by not maintaining these, um, uh, these protocols. Um, so a, a little common sense, uh, a little respect for the other, um, and recognize that my health is your health and your health is my health and my economy is your economy and your economy is my economy. Um, so, um, you know, the cliche yeah. is we're all in this together and uh, that's regrettably true. <laughs> we are all yeah. in this together. And I think, I think one of the most frustrating things that I see, and, and I've heard this from a lot of people, 
is, you know, you go shopping or you go to the doctors and people are wearing uh, their, their PPEs, their masks and gloves. And then you go out to the car, or the bus, and there's masks and gloves littered around the parking lots, in particular grocery stores. And we really need people uh, to have a greater amount of respect for each other. You know, you're wearing those masks and gloves in the outside of your home to stay healthy and not get others sick. Um, but throwing them around and littering uh, doesn't help either. And, and we do have license bylaw licensing officers around the city. They've, many of them have been uh, redirected from their regular work um, to enforce the social distancing laws. And, and littering comes with a $5,000 ticket. So, you know, throwing gloves and a mask around could come with a very steep price if you're actually caught doing that. Don't get me started, Paul. You were, <laughs> I, I was being calm and uh, responsible and uh, respectful up until now. But uh, my wife and I go walking uh, because the gym's closed down in the Highland Creek on a regular basis. And it drives me to some point of insanity to see in a beautiful, beautiful park like the Highland Creek Park, uh, gloves and masks littering the pathway along with a bunch of other junk, by the way, it would be nice yeah. if people took some uh, social responsibility for all of the junk that, um, that uh, litters our parks and makes them much less attractive than they should be. But masks and gloves are just beyond the pale. Anyways, I'll yeah. get off my hobby horse right now. Thank you, John, for- uh, <laughs> For getting off the horse, yes. Oh, no, for- <laughs> As a Highland <laughs> Creek resident, thank you for uh, keeping our community clean. Yeah. Um, so the next question is for you, John. Um, this comes from Renata. Who is responsible for Canada being prepared for an emergency like this pandemic? And how will we ensure that a sufficient supply of PPE and funding to acquire it will be available in the future so that we're never caught off guard? Excellent question. Um, and uh, the primary responsibility lies with the government of Canada. Um, and so being prepared or being fail failing to prepare, I think that's where the responsibility lies. But of course, we are a devolved federation and um, we share that um, ultimate responsibility with uh, the provinces because the provinces are ultimately the uh, deliverers of, of health services. But as a, an overall concept um, on pandemics and things of such as, such as that, um, we are the responsible uh, level of government. Uh, on the secondary issue of um, how can we uh, be better prepared, um, I think that uh, when people look at their tax bill, uh, at which they will inevitably bill, uh, it would be uh, this time next year, while well, probably looking at this time this year, um, they are going to be possibly a little less reluctant to uh, recognize that um, uh, public health is uh, critical to our uh, prosperity as a nation um, and that uh, we need to have independent supplies of um, protective material. Um, so I think a, a serious examination of supply chains. I do not like the notion that we are dependent upon uh, other nations for um, healthcare products. And um, I think uh, as part of the big rethink uh, post pandemic, uh, one of the things that has to be addressed is the supply chains, our ability to make uh, simple things like masks, masks and, um, and gowns, et cetera, but also um, uh, our ability to make uh, basic medicines. Um, you know, the, the drug supply is largely dependent on other nations and uh, hence the issue of, um, of rationing it down to one month supply at a time because uh, we have to be careful that we won't run out. Why? Because a lot of the uh, ingredients to, for those drugs are uh, made elsewhere and we are highly dependent on, upon them arriving on our shores. So I'm glad that question was asked. Um, it will, at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, be the uh, federal government's responsibility. Uh, however, as I say, it is a shared jurisdiction and there is a, there is a necessarily a big rethink that's gonna have to take place um, once uh, we get through this issue. Thank you, John. So this question is from Mohammed. 
I think it's one for both Paul and Missy. We've heard of some missing COVID-19 lab test results. Mohammed wants to know what steps are being taken to avoid a repeat of this occurrence and what is being done to address this issue. Mitzi, do you wanna, I think it's more of a provincial. Right, so testing is uh, is definitely a provincial responsibility. And I, I'm sure Mohammed, you've seen um, many starts and stops when it comes to our testing capacity and on, on in Ontario, uh, at what point the reagent was in short supply, exactly what uh, John, John has just said, that we need to be in better control of our, um, uh, of our supply chain, and particularly for, for, for drugs that are necessary uh, to keep our population safe. And reagent is certainly one of those. And I understand uh, in listening to one of the updates uh, from the um, uh, Dr. Tam uh, that, uh, that there are uh, companies that are now producing reagent uh, in Canada so that we can control those supplies. Uh, we then uh, had a concern around the swabs and uh, whether or not we had enough of those swabs and, uh, and many other aspects of testing that, um, that, that really uh, could have perhaps gone a bit better in Ontario. It is now ramped up where uh, people who are um, working in our health system can get tested and, uh, and people who exhibit uh, symptoms and want to be tested um, ought to be able to be tested at this point. Um, you know, all of our uh, long-term care, um, healthcare workers and, um, and, and, and residents of those settings are also um, having the opportunity to, to be tested. And remember, as I said uh, in an earlier, um, I think it was the opening question about how do we reopen our economy? A condition for opening the economy is our ability to test uh, because unless we can identify uh, who has this virus and contain that individual, the virus will continue to be spread. So testing is, is definitely one of those um, very important indicators that we need to be in place. Uh, you asked specifically around um, the uh, lab tests um, and whether or not uh, we've been able to get all of the tests uh, out of the labs. And, and that's one of the, the areas uh, in terms of our testing that has not gone as smoothly as it should. And at a time when, you know, most of our labs actually are not working at full capacity in Ontario, and that we do have much, much more capacity in this province uh, for testing both at the lab level and, uh, and at the assessment centers that have been set, set up. Uh, so, you know, let's, let's hope that as things evolve and it is one of the measures that the government has put in place to make sure that uh, not only do the number of cases continue to go down over a sustained period of time, two to four weeks, but also the ability to test, to, to track and to trace um, where those individuals have gone and who they've been in contact with is one of the things that we need to do before we can say we're opening up the economy in any sort of way. We have to make sure that we have the ability to keep our population safe and, uh, and get access to those lab results. And, and from, the, from the city side of things, uh, one of the, this is a huge frustration for us. There's the key, I guess, collection mechanism for, for COVID testing. It's con called the Ontario Lab Information System. That's, so if you get swabbed at Centenary Hospital, for example, and all of the test information is supposed to go to the, the to the Ontario Lab Information sy System, and or the OLS. The, it's a portal, and it's all done online. And what I'm hearing from the our health staff is that you know some of the information doesn't get sent in the right format. Um, some information is not sent at all, and it's creating a lag in the system. And that's one of the things we also need to be looking at uh, in, as we're in this pandemic, as we're you know, reviewing what we can do better um, to improve it, to make sure this doesn't happen again. And you know, unfortunately, if we do get a second wave, 
that we get the kinks out of the system so that you, if you uh, think you have COVID-19 or a member of your family, that you get go to an assessment center, uh, you get swabbed or tested, and it goes to the portal like you would expect it to, and that you get your results back in a timely manner. Um, because I think that's what's causing a lot of fear and anxiety with people is waiting weeks for testing when they're told they're going to get a result back in days. Thank you, Missy and Paul. Uh, since we got to a late start, I think we should take maybe just one more question. And this one is for Paul from John. When will communal gardens be reopened for the planting season? And when will public safety protocols for those gardens be ready? And will they have access to necessary supplies to reopen? Yeah, so, so right now, so the community gardens, um, my understanding is they're supposed to, they usually open on May 1st. Uh, we have a directive from the provincial government uh, at this point not to open them. Um, this is also done in cons consultation with Dr. Davila and her staff at the Toronto Public Health. Um, once we have a green light from the province uh, and Dr. Davila is, is satisfied with the protocols and the, the rules that we put in place around social distancing. Uh, we will be issuing permits as soon as possible uh, for those gardens uh, because we really understand how important those gardens are. And we're not just talking flowers, um, we're talking a food source uh, that a lot of people depend on. We actually have a city council meeting tomorrow. And so uh, we will be discussing these the community gardens because you know the weather beautiful weather we know that comes with spring people want to be out there but they also want to ensure that they have a reliable food source that they depend on each year so we'll be doing our best to have those op gardens open as soon as possible. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so we'll just take a couple more. This one is for Mitzi. Um, for People who are collecting Ontario Works or who are on the Ontario Disability Support Program, will their benefits be suspended if they collect the CERB? No, they they do have the opportunity to, um, for those who have some sort of employment income that is demonstrated, they do have the opportunity to collect uh, CERB. The uh, province will allow individuals to keep up to eleven hundred dollars uh, from that uh, from the CERB uh, amount. So we want people to stay attached to to the labor market as much as possible and to those uh, employment incomes that they have access to. I do want to repeat for maybe people who have joined uh, midstream that uh, for people on Ontario Works and ODSP, they will have access to an emergency uh, benefit through OW ODSP through their caseworker and it's $100 and they just need to contact their caseworker for, for that amount. Thank you, Missy. Uh, another one for John. If I am a permanent resident, am I allowed to re-enter Canada? Short answer is yes. You may have to uh, quarantine um, and uh, self-isolate for 14 days as our citizens, as our um, uh, uh, people that are coming across the border in any instant, in any case, uh, but absolutely. Uh, I think that's called the joys of a Canadian passport, isn't it, John? Hmm. Well, um, well, as you know, it's the best passport in the world. And that's uh, right. And uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, people do use it. Um, uh, it does give me uh, an opportunity to give a shout out to the um, uh, to the Minister of Immigration, but also the Minister, uh, the Border Security Minister, our colleague Bill Blair, and also uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, Francois Philippe Champagne. We have literally repatriated thousands and thousands and thousands of Canadians um, who've been stuck abroad by this um, pandemic, and. Um, I, I think I speak on behalf of my office to say that um, we have never ever received more cooperation from any government in, in all the 20 years that I've been practicing politics uh, than uh, in the repatriation of uh, Canadians from abroad. So, um, and the, I, I think that the government has been 
and I know this sounds self-serving, but I think the government has been absolutely outstanding in the repatriation of Canadians. Thanks, Doc. Another one for Paul. What is the timeline for the city's building permit department to reopen? Uh, what's the timeline for the city's building department opening? Uh, we're still reviewing that. We're, we've, really fo we've really focused on how we're dealing with COVID-19. So we're not issuing any uh, new building permits at this point. We do have inspectors that are dealing with any permits that are open now. Uh, we're focusing on how we can deal with uh, people in low income housing situations uh, we have a report on city council tomorrow. We're looking at building modular uh, housing units uh, to look after our homeless people. There's, there's uh, one uh, development that'll be here in Scarborough, um, uh, but we're really focused and we've deployed staff as well into other areas um, that uh, are more relevant at this point in dealing with COVID-19. So once, as we say, always like to say, once we flatten the curve, and uh, we can bring people back into their regular positions, then we'll start issuing uh, building permits again. But it's really fattening the curve and, um, and making sure we can reopen the economy properly. Mm -hmm. I do want to um, touch on some of those stages. Um, you know, I, I talked a, a lot about the requirements from a public standpoint, public health, and, and what the Chief Medical Officer of Health is, is advising. But once, uh, once we have that, uh, you know, we're getting to that stage of opening, it's not gonna be the same as it was before COVID-19. It is going to be a staged, gradual reopening of the economy and of public life in, uh, in our community. So stage one uh, for businesses that were ordered to close or restricted operations, uh, uh, opening select workplaces that can immediately modify their operations to meet public health guidance. And, and those guidances will be made very clear. Um, opening some outdoor spaces like parks and allowing for a greater number of in individuals to attend some events. But when we're talking about events, we're talking about things like you know, funerals. Right now, it's limited to 10 family members. It's such a heartbreaking thing if you lose a loved one and you can't necessarily gather in a way um, to provide that important uh, time of comfort for people. So opening up that ability a little bit more. And of course, as we talked about throughout the call, hospitals would also begin to offer some of the non-urgent and scheduled surgeries um, and, uh, and other healthcare services. So that would be stage one. So, you know, right now we're completely all staying at home and those are the measures that is containing this virus and allowing us to even think about reopening the economy and, and doing things, you know, like getting back to, um, to construction. Stage two would be opening more workplaces um, and that's based on risk assessments, uh, and that may include some service industries and additional offices and retail workplaces, and then some larger public gatherings would be allowed and more outdoor spaces would be open. This all has to be done based on safety. And then stage three is opening all of the workplaces responsibly uh, and further relaxing restrictions on public gatherings. So it's not very specific because it all depends on our ability to contain the virus and to, to reduce the spread so much so that the likelihood of a resurgent uh, is not there. Thank you, Paul and Minsky. Uh, I think this will be our last question and it's open to all of you. It comes from Kamisha. She says, all of you are doing a great job of sharing information about resources, services, and supports available to the public through your e-blasts. What is the strategy for sharing information with Scarborough Guildwood residents who are not connected, like many of our seniors and lower income families? Well, um, let me first of all take the, uh, this opportunity to thank uh, all of our staff for organizing this. Um, in my case, it's a big shout out to uh, Gabe and to Layla and to uh, Natasha and Anessa and, 
and Sean, all of whom have worked on making this. Um, uh, this is an opportunity for us to communicate with our constituents. Uh, the other big benefit is that um, it's not just the MP talking to constituents. It's um, all three MPP, the MP, the uh, city councillor, um, and uh, that is a very large pool of people. Um, as to uh, those who are, if you will, not online or not connected, um, who um, uh, are technophobes like myself, um, there is still the telephone. Uh, we are open um, regular business hours. Uh, our number still works. Um, for those who are slightly more uh, sophisticated, our um, our email is uh, still working. Um, we are still responding. We're getting about 50 or 60 calls a day on a whole variety of issues, um, plus emails. Um, and so um, uh, we are continuing to respond to constituents' concerns. <clears throat> I think we've seen some flattening of those concerns. I don't think it's the curve we want necessarily to flatten, but that's a curve that is flattening. Um, and um, so uh, I think um, Paul and Mitzi and myself will continue to try to uh, do this kind of uh, a reach out and um, and hopefully we'll get out the message. Um, uh, I think we're uh, I think we're doing as uh, as much as uh, can be reasonably expected, but we can always improve. Uh, what you're seeing here is Team Scarborough. And thank you, Kamisha, for the question. You're someone who's doing great work on literacy for, for young people and families in the community. And, um, and one of the things that we do in my office is, uh, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit and we, we could no longer um, take walk-ins into our office, we moved to a virtual service. So uh, emails, uh, phone calls. Uh, the phone calls are actually forwarded uh, to Juliana, who answers those calls on a daily basis during normal business hours. And um, the daily updates, uh, Catherine and I, you know, want to make sure that we are keeping everybody informed of what has materially changed. And every day something is changing, and we want to make sense of the world. So we do that daily update um, to, to benefit our community. We actually held a, a, a virtual town hall that a phone call was sent to every member of the riding and, uh, and, and they were able to uh, answer that call and hear uh, very early on, this was early March, uh, they were able to, to hear the updates directly from, from myself as their MPP and I brought the former Minister of Health who is now uh, MP, um, Helena Jasek, Dr. Helena Jasek. She was actually a former um, chief of chief medical officer for York Region as well. So she had a, a she was a wonderful resource. And you know, this was was in the early stages of the pandemic. So there was a lot of uh, uncertainty, to say the least, than what we're experiencing now. Um, so we reach out. We um, we're, we're coordinating all the time. We don't have all the answers, but we're seeking those answers and we're, we're pushing governments at all levels to be responsive to the needs of people in our community in Scarborough Guildwood. Um, the three of us, uh, um, Paul, John and myself, uh, we talk to, together each week just to make sure we're not missing anything and, and to find out what else we can do. Uh, we will be putting up posters in all of the buildings in our community so that everyone knows um, what areas we're responsible for federally, provincially and municipally and how they can get information. Uh, one of the things that um, people have actually said is that they want those daily updates and uh, and that's why we continue to do them uh, from our survey uh, community members really rely on that information and and you know the emails that we're getting into our office we are taking those very seriously and we are responding to those emails um, one of the concerns for instance that i heard early on was 
personal protective equipment. It was a big issue for workers who were in frontline responsibilities such as long-term care, retirement homes. Um, and what we did was we called all of our retirement homes and long-term care homes, and we're now calling all of our shelters and group homes to find out what do people need in the community and how can we get them the what they need. Um, what services, what supports. And uh, we're all staying at home too, following the public health um, order. And it is an order to stay at home. Um, so we're staying at home, but we're working night and day or over weekends to make sure that we do the best job that we can. And I want to also give a huge shout out to my amazing team. Um, to Catherine, who's moderating tonight. You've done an amazing job, Catherine, and you pulled this together uh, along with other staff from, from the other offices. And also to Lucas, who is uh, new to the team, but doing a fantastic job on the outreach side. And Juliana, who really, when people call the office, they ask for Juliana because she's the case manager who always has the answer to, to the very tough questions that people ask our office. Um, and, uh, and we will just continue to be there. Know that you're not alone. Know that if you need help, um, turn to us, turn to our offices, and we will do our best uh, to, to find you the answer that you need. Okay. Uh, Kamisha, I want to thank you as well for the, for the question. Uh, I want to thank John and Mitzi for doing this, you know, in part to uh, Kamisha's answer about how we're reaching out. The three of us have always worked very well together. Uh, on, on one level, it's just old fashioned politics. As, as Mitzi mentioned right now with the pandemic, the three of us have a weekly phone call to, to make sure uh, and kind of air what our concerns are in the community so we all understand what the needs are and uh, what people are looking for in terms of help and assistance. Uh, this past week, we were talking about uh, sourcing masks and what we could do to help group group homes, long-term care homes, our nursing homes, uh, you know, and I'm glad we had this uh, town hall meeting. I hope we can do more of them. Uh, I have a monthly email newsletter, or well, it was monthly, it's daily now, or a couple of times daily you can sign up for by calling my office or, or filling out a form on my website, but a lot of it is uh, my staff, and I want to thank my staff. We're, uh, you know, we don't really have standard office hours right now. We're trying to take care of everybody's concerns and requests as soon as they come in. Uh, and sometimes that's a 24 seven job. Uh, but we understand the health crisis that's going on here and people need answers. And the quicker we can get answers to people, uh, the calmer they seem to be. And, uh, and we can all move forward together and flatten the curve. Thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Thank you, Paul, Mitzi, and John for, for being here, for answering questions, and for the care that you show to your community. Um, hopefully, we can do this again soon. And I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Be, be safe. Thanks. Take care. Be safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Be safe.